All right, Eric, welcome to uh, the inaugural episode, I think, of Bitcoin Builders, the Breakdowns Bitcoin Builders. I- I'm super excited uh, to have you on the show. I'm super excited to kick off the show with you. Thanks for having me on, Nathaniel. It's been forever, so it's good to talk to you again. Yeah, so uh, this is actually where I want to start. So uh, I was thinking back through it, and I think that the first place we met and that, or at least that I had consciousness of uh, of you was... Um, was TechSoup's Net Squared event in some part of San Francisco or not, you know, the, the greater Bay Area yeah. in 2008. Uh, you were building Ushahidi, which I, which I want to talk about. Uh, and I had a project called Asset Map, uh, which was focused on Uganda, which is all about local resource mapping of, uh, of Ugandan community organizations. And for the next few years, I feel like we were on a very similar junket. It was sort of the, the Pop Tech Ted Skull World Forum uh, social entrepreneurship roundabout. And that was sort of of like this very exciting moment where the web had just come back for a lot of people, right? Post post sort of, you know, web 1.0 implosion. You had the first sort of, uh, you know, acquisitions in web two and, you know, these platforms were coming into their own and we had the Arab Spring and all, there was all this sort of excitement around what these sort of technologies might do. And a lot of folks were, were interested in what they could do in terms of, uh, in terms of impact, in terms of conflict issues, in terms of sort of like, you know, things, things beyond the, the San Francisco Bay Area. And and, you know, uh, it was always super exciting to see uh, what, what you were doing then. And, and I think that it, it is actually quite relevant for what I think makes what you're doing now so interesting and, and sort of, you know, different in some ways than, than other folks who are, who are coming at Bitcoin projects. But I actually want to start even farther back just because, you know, it's sort of part of your story. Um, for those who aren't familiar with, with your background, I, I'd love to hear just a little bit about sort of, you know, h- how you grew up because it's, you know, very, very different than, uh, than a lot of folks who will be listening. Yeah, sure. I, well, first, I want to start by, you know, saying I was laughing. I was thinking and laughing when you just said that that tech soup event, because I hadn't thought about it in so many years. And that was when we actually got our first money for Shahidi. So that was a good memory. Yeah, I had um, to I had to go back and look up what it was actually called because <laughs> I remember. Yeah, no, the stuff like about good, it. I, but <laughs> no, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. And yeah, I mean, it was some great people too. very optimistic time in the Internet. Um, okay, but uh, well, yeah, where I started. So I grew up in in South Sudan and then in Kenya and then North Sudan. I kind of bounced back and forth between those two countries um, uh, in my childhood. I grew up out here. My parents were linguists. And so, you know, that was my, why I was in Africa at all. And um, and along that road, kind of got intro to technology because uh, because they were linguists. My dad had access to a computer before many people in the States did. And so I was doing like any other kid and I was trying to play video games on it and back delivering through some DOS prompts and stuff like that. And just, you know, dinking around on it. And, uh, but that was back in the time of copper wires in Africa was the only phone lines you could get. And it would take three years to get a phone line. And, you know, it was just a different time it was the kind of late eighties, early nineties. And, um, and yeah, then I went to the U S for, for university after that. And, uh, Got introduced to the internet at right at the beginning of it in the U.S. and um, and I guess the rest is history from for me on that front. I just I went into into technology fairly quickly, and, you know, uh, just bumped along. So one of the things that's been interesting, and I think fair to say, a, a pretty common thread through your career slash stuff you've done, because I feel like you you have one of those careers where there's a lot of stuff that manifests as projects that then turn into businesses, but you also sometimes start them as sort of hobbies or just passions and it it all kind of gets blended up. So I remember reading Afrogadget uh, back in the day around this time, you know, and, and it, it feels to me like one of these, one of the earliest times that you were sort of playing this bridge role, basically bringing to a larger audience uh, uh, the way in which these technologies or just technology in general was being used and lived around in, in, in Africa specifically. Yeah, you know, I've, I've often thought that there's not very many, well, at that time, which I think I started that blog in 2006, if I remember correctly. Um, and, and then it was joined by another, a bunch of other African uh, people who had, friends of mine who would just start writing different posts themselves about what they found. But, you know, that was about um, finding the stories of African ingenuity, um, often on the side of the road, places that you wouldn't normally look. And it was because there weren't stories being told um, yet about them. And so there was, there was something interesting there in just telling the stories, but then also saying, 
look actually how ingenious this is. Look what's happening here. Um, and actually seeing behind what could often be seen as a as kind of low tech was low tech. And it was ingenuity born of necessity that actually grew these businesses and and helped these people make a living for themselves. Um, but I think I think often in my life it's it's being uh, willing to just try things. Um, something that's interesting to me might be interesting to others and just seeing if there's something there. Uh, and once there's been a, um, a little bit of traction with it, some, some other people have gotten involved and, and started seeing, uh, an interest in that as well, then it grows. Um, and just being willing to do it. Cause I think there's a lot of people that are probably better at these things than I am, but they, um, they don't do it. They don't build it. Yeah. I and mean, listen, there's a, there's a, <laughs> the difference between, uh, between a lot of good ideas and, and good things that happen is just people willing to try them. Right. Um, no, but I, I think part of, part of what makes, uh, Afrogadget a relevant part of the story and not just sort of ancient history is that, you know, even in just listening to you and in a couple other venues describe gridless and what it's like to, to build, uh, that, and just so you know, I will have introduced gridless. So people have, have some sense in the, in the intro, but l- listening to describe how, uh, you know, how the actual implementation, opera, uh, operationalization of that, how it works in terms of maintenance and things. There are common threads of, you know, uh, you know, you can't just order a replacement part, right? There's a lot of times that you have to do things and, and get creative. Uh, so so, uh, so I, I, we will connect the dots back to this. But then I, I want to talk about sort of uh, U- Ushahidi next. And, um, you know, I, I'd love to hear just sort of the, the origins of that project you just mentioned before uh when we were talking before that you just had your sort of final board meeting 15 years on but where did that project start and and you know what, what was it what was it trying to do and i guess how has it evolved Whew. okay yeah so interesting actually some of the people that were involved with afrogadget were involved with the beginning of ushahidi too there was a there was a nascent gathering of people on the internet that started to grow around uh, just how can you use technology to to do things that um, are are good in Africa? And, and sometimes that can be good in the social sense, and sometimes it can be good in the business sense. And um, so Ushahidi grew out of the 2008 post-election violence in Kenya. And um, a number of us were were writers, bloggers at the time, and we're th- and technologists, and we're thinking about how could technology be used as our country was falling apart. And uh, the the idea simply was. You know, could we could we gather information from ordinary people and just put it on a map? I mean, nothing special, really. That it's a very simple idea. Um, at that time, I think Google Maps had been around for four years, five years. Um, we we started. You know, David Kobia, Juliana Rotich, and Ori Okolo and I got together and just started building this thing out. It took us three days to build, and uh, we released it. And it allowed people just to send in a USSD text because. Twitter wasn't very big then by, you know, by any uh, stretch of the imagination in Africa and uh, neither was Facebook or anything else. So you had to use what people had in their pockets and what they had was a dumb phone. And so you had to be able to take uh, text messages and put those on a map. And so we started doing that and it exploded. Um, It exploded because it was a new way to think about crisis mapping, a new way to think about gathering information from ordinary people. And uh, we said, okay, well, maybe we should make this into a platform that other people can use in their own countries. Uh, and, and we started to do that and um, got used in South Africa for some, uh, some issues of violence they were having there, xenophobic attacks. And then, um, you know, there was, there was use of it in, in the Indian elections and uh, in the war on Gaza, all these other places just started to use it and deploy our software. And so we, we kind of tripped into becoming an organization and uh, expanded from there. And so uh, one of the things, to some extent, this is me catching up on the story because I was sort of around and paying attention for the the first era, the first few years as it started to expand and it was being used. You know, what were the what were the the late teens and early 20s? You know, what is the kind of the state of that project now? Are people using it for the same things? Has it evolved? You know, because it was born of this very interesting contrast between a lot of turmoil and upheaval in the world, but also a lot of optimism about technology's ability to help, right? And, and the sort of power of crowds to help. And I think in some ways, <laughs> we've lost some of that optimism more broadly around technology. And so I'm interested in, in you know, is that the case with Ushahidi or, you know, has, has it continued to sort of be a beacon? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, 
it it really has continued to be used. I think Ushiji has been used in over 200 countries now, 200,000 plus deployments of it. It's open source, so it's been translated into over 50 languages. And, and it's really inspiring to see it. And what I think we forget, especially those of us who are technologists who are on the front edge of new tech and things that are happening, is that there's just millions of people who aren't. And they're in places that may need something. And it's so easy for them to uh, just jump on and, and create an Ushahidi instance, uh, like a map for themselves, and then deploy it in their own community. And so they do. So, you know, during COVID, there was hundreds and hundreds of COVID maps being put out, uh, whether it's being used in Ukraine or uh, some other current event, uh, like the Nigerian elections and stuff like that. It, it just gets used. And oftentimes, because it's an open source project, we, we hear about it after the fact. We don't know it's, ha- it's being used because people have downloaded and run the software on their own. And so for, for people who, who kind of aren't, aren't familiar, when, when you say it gets used, so there's, there's two pieces of that. Like one is actually collecting information, uh, you know, that, that is, is mappable, right? So physical instances of violence in the case of sort of post-conflict elections, but then who, who makes use of that information? I mean, obviously it's different in different cases, but who are the types of people who need that information, I guess? Well, let me let me take one to something in the Western Hemisphere. So um, I'll get, I can give a couple examples, but one of them that comes to mind was the, and you would have known about this too, was the the Haiti um, earthquake, right? And mm-hmm. you know who was who was using Ushahidi then? Well, it was everybody, whether you were the Red Cross, the U.S. Marine Corps, or the UN. Everybody used it because it was stood up within a few hours of the earthquake, and it took I think you and Ocha another three days to get going on the ground. Meanwhile, that's, you know, that's many hours of people being trapped or without food, without water. And so having a tool like that, that uh, was digital, allowed everybody to see what was happening in real time, you know, kind of take out a ticket about, okay, I'm going to solve that problem. And then somebody else will take out another ticket. I'm going to solve that problem. That's, that's what happened. And that's what happens today still too, whether, you know, it's uh, floods in Pakistan or fires in Australia, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, it gets deployed and then People rally around it. The, the tool is actually really like 10% of the problem being solved. The rest is actually management and people working together uh, to, to help each other. It's super interesting. I think that one of the things that was fascinating about it was it, it was sort of, you know, <clears throat> It, it it so quickly jumped out of its African context uh, and, and was just sort of, you know, it was almost incidental that it was born where it was born. And it just, it turns out that this was sort of a need in so many different types of situations. Um, I'm interested to kind of zoom forward a little bit in your career. Uh, so from, from Ushahidi, you, you start to found the iHub uh, and that sort of becomes a, uh, a, a source of of resourcing and support for lots of other types of startups. So, so tell us a little bit about about iHub and you know how, how that got started and and how it has evolved. So that was also in two thousand. Started the genesis of that started in two thousand eight. Um, uh, you know, there's a number of people in the tech community. Ushahidi had just gotten going. We were getting some strong success, and um, you know, we were meeting. We met up at an event. You know how you have these like different conferences and things like that that were happening back in the day, and um, and we were we were sitting around saying, "Hey, why does it take you know an event like this to bring us together? We're a community. Um, how come we can't just have a place of our own?" And um, and so, you know, we start. I started writing about it right away and blogging about it and trying to trying to raise money from the Googles and the Microsofts of the world. And nobody wanted to fund this idea. They were like, "There's not enough. There's not enough." tech guys in, in Kenya, there's, you know, I mean, how many software d- developers are there? Uh, you know, that kind of thing. And so we just plugged along. And finally, you know, a year later, uh, the founders of Ushi said, you know what, we've been fairly successful in fundraising, let's just build this ourselves. And so we threw the money in to build the iHub and then spun it out independently so that it was its own entity that Ushi didn't own it. And, um, and yeah, I have became this place, this, you know, this nerve center for the tech community in Nairobi, where everybody would come together, uh, whether you're a software engineer, a designer, a blogger, uh, you know, some researcher, and then media people would come in to try and find stories and investors if they wanted to find somebody to invest in. That's that's where they'd stop first. Uh, so it was funny because we found it in March of 2010. And uh I think within about two months, uh, we already had, you know, Google, Microsoft, all those other people as partners. 
and um, it just exploded. I mean, I think within a few months, we had 2,000 members. We had to kind of come with a membership strata so that we could fit enough people in the room. And um, and then we got to, you know, I think by the end of the year, four or 5,000 users. By the next year, 10,000 users, uh, users, members. And um, I think we, at our peak, we got to 17,000 members. And um, it's you know, that was within two and a half years of, of founding it. And, um, and it was just because people needed to find each other and, um, and it was a place that they could do that and it would catalyze more things. And it became, you know, the I have itself was, was a part co-working space, you know, part, um, community space, part event space. It was, it was really a part of many things. And, um, I remember, I remember the world bank came in in 2011 and they said, Hey, Eric, how much money would it take to do this in 12 more countries in Africa? And I said, zero, because we're not going to do it. We know Nairobi. We're, we're from Kenya. This is our place. Now, if anybody wants to come here and learn from us, they can. But we're, we have no interest in trying to, to do this in other countries and other cities. And, um, and then, you know, we, we also formed, um, we formed an, an entity uh, that would become the umbrella for all the other tech hubs in Africa and, and people would come and visit. And then that whole thing exploded. Now there's something like, I don't know, 200 different tech hubs, 400 tech hubs across Africa. It's like hard to keep track anymore. So, okay. So just to, for those who are sort of following along, we've got, uh, sort of these initial, uh, experiments in blogging and media telling the stories of how, uh, of how Africans are, are kind of using ingenuity to use technology differently and, and solve problems. We've got this sort of, uh, you know, new use of mobile technology in the form of Ushahidi to, uh, to kind of, you know, started with an African problem or an African issue and then expanded everywhere. And then you've got iHub, which is sort of, you know, incubating this nascent community, uh, that sort of, you know, that, that's kind of growing with technology. But then you find your way into a sort of a specific problem that, that you want to dig into, uh, which is sort of last mile computing. So, so how did Brick come about uh, and, and what was that sort of trying to solve? Yeah, I think Brick came about because of two things. One is I've always loved hardware and, and tinkering around with things. And I forget it was a little bit like that, right? It was us looking at hardware in Africa, like ordinary people on the side of the road building different tech. And this was us saying, and, and the second part was that software engineers were starting to be able to get into hardware. It was more approachable than it ever had been before. And so I was, I was sitting there kind of thinking there's, there's got to be a problem to be solved with hardware in Africa that we haven't been thinking about. And it took me, it took me months to come up with a solution. Uh, and it came about after a conversation in South Africa with another, uh, another entrepreneur. And, um, you know, in which to, at which point he's, you know, I, I said, I suggested that he build his own router. And he said, Eric, that would take way too much time and cost way too much money. <laughs> I got on the plane and I drew out this like, you know, brick shaped uh, device that would be a new way for us to have a redundant power and connectivity um, kit together in one place. And uh, that was called brick because it was shaped like a brick, not because there's any acronym for it. And he was right. It cost way too much money and it took way too much time. But we we were able to raise investment and we were able to build it out and yeah I think you know it was it's been it was it was a very interesting journey with Brick because um, with Brick we were we were thinking at first about how to build this piece of hardware and hardware is fun it's cool especially if you're a tech guy and then you got to look at the business and I quickly realized that you know a linear business is all you can do with just straight hardware and and also that we weren't solving the more complicated problem in Africa, which is how do you actually connect people to the internet? We might've made the most rugged router in the world, but we didn't mean that we were solving a real problem yet. And so Brick uh, pivoted, his first pivot was into saying, okay, how can we then leverage our hardware to solve the problem of connecting people to the internet? Uh, and as we look deeper into the problem, you know, as you can imagine, across Africa is about 1.1 billion people. And uh, most of them don't, even if they have a signal around them or if they have a smartphone in their pocket, they, they can't afford the internet. And so how do you actually make it affordable? And coming up with uh, new models for affordable internet and then deploying it, uh, you know, that was called Moja. Moja Wi-Fi was deployed across Kenya and Rwanda and um, inside of our, our buses and transportation system, as well as in physical locations, um, static locations all over the countries. Um, grew to be the the largest uh, public Wi-Fi network in Africa, uh, with over a million monthly active unique users, 
And um, so, yeah, it was it was it was it was a fun uh, it was a fun company to build and some great people to build it with. So, OK, so you're learning about or you're, you're as you dig into this, you you sort of are seeing or all of these different issues around uh, the actual Internet connectivity issue. But how much are you starting to think about uh, last mile energy issues as well uh, a, as you're going through this? I mean, is that is that sort of just lurking around the corner as the other thing that needs to be solved? And you're not you know, you just happen to not be solving that one yet or, you know, kind of where where is the energy piece? Yeah, it becomes it becomes uh, pretty apparent that it's an important thing right right away. As soon as we start getting to rural connectivity, uh, because you don't always have just a, a place you can plug something in, and so you start having to supply your own solar, your own backup batteries into these in different installations, and that's what made us realize that the the foundation on which twenty first century twenty first century economies stand is made up of of power and, and connectivity. Those two things. On top of them, there's all these other pillars, and it could be healthcare or government services or um, B2B work or some type of e-commerce play, whatever it is. They all sit on top of those two uh, foundational elements. And, you know, I always used to say, well, we don't have any time or energy to work on on power. So let's work. Let's continue to just work on connectivity. And, and we did. Um, it wasn't until we were selling brick uh, that we, we said, OK, we can look at this ener- energy thing a little bit more. But I have to tell you, there's a there's a little caveat to that story that the idea that it would be Bitcoin mining uh, had actually come up um, about nine years earlier in 2013. Um, when the Ken, in, in Kenya, we have the largest wind farm in Africa. It's almost 400 megawatts. So it's up in the northern part of the of, of the Ken, of Kenya on Lake Turkana. It's called the Turkana Wind Farm Project. And um, in 2000, at the end of 2013, we we're raising our capital. We had some good commitments already. And Philip uh, Walton, my business partner, said, hey, what if we took some containers and we just, you know, put them up there at the wind farm and and just ran Bitcoin uh, mining right there? And I was like, well, I was like, gee, Philip, that'd be like a, that's a that's a whole other business that we've got to raise like probably 10 million dollars for minimum. Like, it's crazy. Like, uh, I'm not sure we, we should be looking at that. We have a business that we've already just started. I don't think we should be pivoting to anything else right now. And um, the reason why that was interesting was because the wind farm, they, the Kenyan government had done a deal um, with this independent power producer to uh, supply the energy. And they had to pay uh, no matter if they used it or not. And they hadn't uh, planned for distribution. So, I mean, they hadn't built the power lines from that far, far northern part, of a very inhospitable, just it's like a lunar landscape up there. Uh, they hadn't planned on how to get it back, you know, the 600 miles or so they needed to uh, to distribute it to the rest of the country. That took another six years. And so what Philip was saying was right. If we had planted uh, some Bitcoin mining containers up there at the time, I'm, I'm sure we'd all be flying around in helicopters right now. Um, or those containers would have been stolen by some shift uh, and we, you know, we never would have seen them again. <laughs> you know, who knows? Um, but it, it's a it's a funny story. And, it's, and, it, and it does speak to the history of we've been thinking about Bitcoin mining in 2013. Um, and hadn't really plugged it together with the with with the uh, kind of real time demand leveling that's needed by uh, by these independent power producers until you know uh, 2021 I think is when we started on this. Yeah, so so let's talk about that transition because actually you you jumped ahead to one of my questions was going to be, you know, what what your perception of Bitcoin was was it something you just weren't thinking about was it kind of lurking in the background it sounds like it was it was lurking in the background you're just focused elsewhere you know when did you make the transition to really wanting to hold aside the Bitcoin piece hold, you know dig into the energy side of this equation yeah so yeah you're right we've I, I've been knowledgeable and planned to do something about it in 2010 as well right. Um, and didn't do anything. 2013 didn't do anything. 2018, I bought my own miners for myself and then ended up selling them and buying property instead. Like I'd done this three times now and not done it. And um, I was like, you know what? Um, I'm going to do something with Bitcoin no matter what now. Um, and I finally had time. Maybe one of the blessings of COVID was having the ability and chance to read more. Uh, and to get deeper into stuff. So it was, it was podcasts like your own, um, listening to guys like you and Nick Carter and uh, people thinking it and talking through this. And I was thinking about the software space a lot. And then I was like, well, mining is actually something we, we can do. We know hardware. We know rural infrastructure. Um, we know software. We know connectivity. Like this is something that might be difficult for others, but actually it's, it's in our wheelhouse already. And um, so started digging into it deeper and deeper 
um, and then coming up with business plans for it. It was the wild west of Bitcoin pricing at the time, right? Like it just kept going up. It was just, it seemed like, seemed like we would completely miss the boat. And, um, and, you know, but we kept gnawing on it. And I said, it doesn't matter. I said, I'm going to do it this time. So we're going to do it. And, um, finally the, the, um, we got some interest in somebody financing us, like helping us kind of build out the initial, um, uh, you know, the plans. And uh, it took forever. And I was really frustrated at the time, uh, but it was, a, it was a blessing because what happened was the Bitcoin price started to go down. Bitcoin miners became less expensive and less expensive. And by the time we launched the company, they it was in a pretty good space and it, uh, it, it's only gotten better since uh, as far as the, uh, the economics of the, of the business that we're in. Okay, so I, I want to get I want to dig deep into sort of gridless and, and and what you guys are doing. But I think first, what would be super helpful is just a little bit of of background on the energy landscape in Africa. You know what what is sort of the you know a, a, an average person's interaction with energy, or you know maybe that's not the right way to frame it. But you know wh- wh- for for those who have spent no time thinking about this, you know uh, how should they think about sort of the the good question. So maybe to set a. Uh, an example of energy usage. The U.S. uses about five and a half times as much energy as the whole continent of Africa does every year. So that's one country as opposed to a full continent. 350 million people as opposed to 1.1 billion, to give you an idea of how much energy people use. So with that in mind, you can see uh, there's even something that's more interesting as you stratify that Between the North African countries and South Africa, that makes up 70% of the energy usage in the continent. So that means 30% of the energy usage in Africa is between the North American countries and South Africa. Sorry, the North African countries and South Africa. There's this middle ground. This, And it's um, it means that you get decent electricity when you're in urban environments. Um, It might not always be on. It's raining here in Nairobi right now, so I'm hoping my power doesn't go out. And, um, and, and individuals, the further you get from the city, um, have less disposable income, uh, especially if they're in the rural agricultural belt. And so, uh, oftentimes they will not use very much electricity at all. Uh, the spikes are between, you know, six and eight in the morning and six and nine at night. And then besides that, you probably won't use very much electricity at all. And so when you started to think about gridless and you were looking at Bitcoin, obviously you had the sort of instinct that there was something interesting to bring together the pieces that, that you knew with Bitcoin mining. But, you know, it, it feels like the goal is less about Bitcoin mining. Bitcoin mining is the tool in order to sort of provide uh, more sustainable energy production, right? Is that, is that fair? Maybe, maybe this is a good point to describe gridless a little bit and, and what you guys are trying to build. Yeah, I think what you're saying is part of it. It's um, yes, it does make uh, power more sustainable, specifically mini grids and small IPP, so small independent power producers, as they're further out on the edge of the of the uh, of the. So actually, let me let me let me rewind a little bit. What you have in Africa, specifically in Kenya and any of these um, kind of even more advanced African countries, is you have a pretty good grid network. Um, it goes it goes pretty well around the country, but it actually ends where it's financially viable. And so the national grid won't push further uh, when it's, once it gets to a certain stage because they know the marginal return on the users further out there is just not going to ever make up for the expense to, to put in the power. And so if you go into countries that are even um, you know have less uh, income, you'll see uh, like in Malawi, the grid doesn't go as far. Um, Zambia, same thing. And so, so when you, when you look at it, if you really want an expansion of energy in the continent, you need to look at mini grids. Mini grids are generally independent power producers who are going off and they're trying to connect a village or a few villages at a time. And so for them to be, uh, for them to be sustainable, they need to have a certain amount of usage and they just don't get it from those, from those rural uh, retail users from the from the villages themselves. They need businesses, and so Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining specifically is this geographically agnostic industrial offtaker of energy. We can go anywhere; doesn't matter where it is. It can be way off grid. We don't care. And as we get there, we can set up the connectivity. We can sit there and mine the Bitcoin and use that excess power that they have at these sites. 
In fact, what we can do is we can sign on before you even build your next site as your anchor tenant. And that gets really interesting. So what does Gridless do? Gridless, you know, supports the, uh, the electrification of Africa. Uh, and it supports the decentralization of the Bitcoin network. Talk to me about the last, so these independent power producers, these mini grids, have, have, has it been sort of a story where over the last decade or whatever the right time period is, these projects try to get up and running and they just become uneconomical or they need sort of, you know, NGO style financing? Like, what, you know, what, what, I guess maybe the, the way to frame the question is what is the landscape that Gridless is coming into from a, from a sort of business standpoint, from an economic standpoint? You know, how many of these networks are there? Are they all over? Are they small? You know, because that it seems like that they're sort of part of what Gridless is doing is supporting a thing that existed but was having trouble uh, self-sustaining almost. Yeah, that's a, it's a, it's a great question. I, uh, I came into the energy sector not knowing a whole bunch, and I've been having to learn along the way as well, and I still am. Um, one of the interesting things I found out is that it takes somewhere between three to six years to get financing for even these little mini grids. And uh, the reason why is it largely comes from concessionary financing from DFIs and foundations. And um, because of that, it just is very slow. It's very bureaucratic. Uh, and um, it's it, it's very difficult for the entrepreneurs trying to build these mini grids for to make the case for why they need to to build it. Well, everybody knows why they need to build it, actually, but that they can build it and that they they will get a return on investment. And there, there's a good reason for that, too, which is they're not sustainable. They just aren't like what happens is. You know, you go and build this thing and then you you're supposed to wait for 20 years to, to maybe get a return on investment. So most normal investors would never look at that and say, OK, that's something I want to get into. You, you have better places to put your money. So the concessionary funding kind of makes sense. And so does them all. So do so do the financiers all expecting some 20, 25 year power purchase agreement to be signed before they want to fund them anyway, which is almost impossible to get it to. So, you know, along we come and we're looking at this at this space and we're saying, well, hold on a second. If we can come in as anchor tenant and we can provide, uh, you know, some financing into the space as well, doesn't that just make it sustainable? And it does. Right. We become a really great anchor tenant um, in, in the mini grid space. You know, we have uh, about 5000 mini grids across Africa, um, approximately. The continent needs about 140,000 according to the World Bank. Uh, so, so we're like 70 well, X or something like that. Yeah, 70 X and, and within the, like, the next 20 years that, yeah. too. Yeah, it's, it's a ridiculous X. amount. Of, the, and the amount of money flowing into it is minuscule. So everybody knows that mini grids actually are the right solution to push electrification to the edges of Africa. Um, they're also not releasing the money to do so. The billions and billions of dollars that are needed to do so it just are not going to come. And so, especially if we're looking at the same old either government, um, FDI, or foundation level, there's going to be some that comes from there. But really what we need is real investment. And real investment can only look at the space if there's real returns. And real returns come from a completely different dynamic in the way that business is, is organized. And in our case, we think that, you know, you know obviously – being objective is hard when you're actually in, in the same space. But, you know, we think that that comes from Bitcoin mining coming alongside as a partner. And first of all, just helping to make these places sustainable, um, these businesses sustainable and um, helping uh, kind of increase the connectivity and decrease the cost for the community. The second part comes in where I think that Bitcoin mining will help and probably be involved in the electric, uh, the energy project itself, where they might be involved in the financing of it and the ownership of it too. Uh, we'll see on that front in the years ahead. But uh, but I think it's you know you you it's it's early still to say this, but I think it might be uh, the silver bullet that's missing. It feels like this is a I mean this is a classic challenge of a situation where everyone agrees. Uh, it's probably not too much disagreement that it would be better if there was, you know, uh, reliable energy in all these places, right? These 140,000 mini grids that were needed. I don't think there's anyone probably standing around that says, no, we shouldn't do that, right? <laughs> we should keep those people in the dark. But then the, the, the 
path between that and them actually getting there, the market as it's been organized so far does not, there is not an, a viable market solution, which leaves the only option formerly to be other sources of funding that aren't sort of market driven, which brings with it all sorts of challenges in terms of long term sustainability, in terms of, you know, the bureaucracy needed to get it up and running in terms of, you know, where that capital, what, what other problems that capital, you know, could be deployed for and, and all those sort of challenges, right? The classic challenges of, of any sort of issue like that. And, uh, and this is a, a force that potentially puts this problem into the realm of market viability. So it's off the docket for that sort of, you know, that limited f- pool of, uh, of sort of non market market capital, right? No, that's right. I mean, the the incentives aren't aligned properly yet, and that's because it's come from a, pl- a place that has been not economically viable. And, you know, in those places, that, those spaces that are not economically viable, like Ushahidi back in 2008, it gets funding from foundations, right? And, uh, you know, that's that's kind of what makes sense. Um, you look You look into the future, though, and you see a new way of doing something. I, you know, if you've ever built a business, there's a, a moment that comes when you see and you say, "Oh, there's something here." And then if you're onto it, you get this feeling in your gut, and you're like, "Okay, this is actually it. This is something special. This is this is different." And I remember getting that feeling with Gridless, and I was like, "Oh, there's actually something really big here." And the reason why is it changes the dynamic of a whole industry. And, you know, I think that's what's missed on the people who are in the energy space today in Africa is that they've had a they've had it the same way for so long that it's hard for them to see that it can be done a new way. And so us coming in along and, and, and proving it is what's necessary for it to gather and get adoption. And um, there's a there's there's no independent power producer that has a problem working with us. Everybody's excited when we talk to them. Uh, it's it's generally. Uh, the financiers of it uh, who are having a harder time getting their head around it and they need to see it in action and let it prove itself out first. Sure. I mean, that that makes sense is that the, the, the capital reacts to opportunity that's demonstrated versus sort of, you know, in in many cases makes bets unless it's a a type of capital that's specifically designed for making those bets. Um, I do actually want to come back to that piece because I, I, you know, one of the places that I want to have sort of the conversation end off is the set of infrastructure that, you know, that you guys are uncovering that needs to be built around this for it to, to reach its full kind of maximum potential. But maybe let's make this practical. You know, where are you guys? I know that there's a set of pilots going on. It'd be great to hear about, you know, what those pilots are, how the relationship works, you know, kind of, you know, on the ground, what, what you're seeing, what's been different than what you expected, just so people can kind of get a, a, a more practical view of it. Yeah. I mean, everything looks good on spreadsheets. It's, a, it's when you put it into <laughs> action on the ground, when you get your feet dirty, that things change. Um, yeah. So uh, our sites in Kenya have been really great. We have, well, great in some ways and not in others. So um, in Kenya, we have a great partner, uh, Hydrobox, who's been fantastic. They're continuing to build out a bunch of mini grids all across the country, and we're riding along with them on every single one of them. Uh, even if it's down to 20 kilowatts, we can work with them, right? And um, and what's been interesting, why, why, when you're that closely tied to an organization, you get to deal with all the issues that they're dealing with as they build out new sites. Um, sometimes it's just they've commissioned a new site, they're dealing with some issue with the turbine, and we have to kind of go up and down with them. That's fair. It, we understand it. Um, the other thing is acts of God that you have nothing to do about, that you can't do anything about. Um, for instance, we you know we had historically low rainfall at the end of last year. And so uh, it was like a 40 year low in rain. And that meant the rivers are very low and we couldn't operate uh, the turbines on full capacity. So that meant our mining that, you know, on paper, we should have been up here and in in how much Bitcoin we were mining, we were instead down here. And it was really frustrating, but there's nothing anybody can do about it. Um, we can't, we can't make more water go through our partners were fantastic. Again, they laid out 50 kilowatts of solar to add to it, just to give us a little bit more umph during the day. Um, and you know, that's just kind of the things you have to learn and do the Bitcoin mining itself. I mean, maybe this is one of the benefits of, of being hardware and infrastructure guys from before is that we, we kind of, that hasn't been too much of a problem. Like we, we, you know, we install the the miners, we let them run. If they have an issue, we fix them. Um, just like running any other kind of network. 
Now, Malawi has been a little different. Malawi is a, a site that has been around for a little while. Great, a great setup, great build out of, um, of their powerhouses. Um, but we had two issues that happened there. One is, again, once you're on the ground, um, we had you know, a villager um, come and cut down the power pole that held up the solar that was our relay connection for connectivity um, to steal the battery. They stole the battery, and so we had to put a new one in, so we were down for a few days while that happened. Um, and then the, you know, the elders and the chiefs take care of it in the village, but you know, you're still down for a few days. And we realized that we need to get some you know, redundancy in our connection. Uh, fortunately, we know the Starlink guys pretty well, and they've been very, very helpful to us being beta testers with them. And um, so we've started to get those units in now. The other thing that happened was we had a big cyclone hit. So a um, big cyclone hit Malawi, and it just destroyed things. Bridges were out, roads washed away. Um, the Again, the, the, the sites that were out there, um, they had built them amazingly well. Nothing broke. Uh, so we was able to keep going during that time. Our solar panels, you know, flew away and um, we replaced them and off, off we are to the races again. You know, so you have difficulties along the way, um, things in the trenches that happen that don't happen when you're in a more maybe stable environment, um, a stable continent than Africa. But, you know, that's the, that's what you have to deal with. Right. And you have to have the uh, fortitude to deal with the things that, that come your way. Um, it, you know, the old saying in entrepreneurship is that it was easy. Anybody would do it. So this is, it's actually interesting. Like the, the, the infrastructure that you guys need around this is it's different. So you need expertise in terms of setting up the, uh, you know, the, the actual mining units and, and the sort of the, where, where they live and, and the relationship to the power, you presumably need some amount of, of maintenance around that, which is probably not the same as what it would be. You need security, which also probably means local relationships, which is a whole additional element of it. And then it, you, you need sort of adaptability in terms of, you know, the, the sort of uh, the challenges that come up. I mean, how much of that, as you guys think about expansion, you know, is it is it challenging to look beyond sort of where you guys have core, you know, core assets in, in Kenya? I mean, I guess Malawi is your first test case. No, that's that's what we're doing, Daniel. Like we Malawi was so that we could see if we could run our operations outside of our own country. So it's a, it was a small site just set up. Uh, we're about to expand it. Um, but to see if we could actually do and run the processes and and run run the system the same way we do it in in Kenya, and we've been able to do it, and we're going to open up our third country uh, in about six weeks' time, and you know we think we can probably handle four to five countries total. Um, and you know you've operated in Africa, you know this. It's like one of the things you have to deal with is the uh, the different risk, economic, political, uh, social of any specific geography. And so you don't want to be tied down to one specifically either. Um, and you want to have a couple locations that you can, you can maintain some uh, revenue stream from. Uh, that's the same thing for us. So Kenya is great. We're going to continue to grow our operations here. Uh, we're looking at different uh, energy uh, in the continent. Uh, right now we're very heavy in hydro, but we're looking at, can we do some kind of hybrid with wind and solar? Um, so what happens with geothermal? Kenya is one of the best places in the world for geothermal. So maybe do a test out in that at some point. Um, we're actually doing a solar test for the first time ever, um, which just doesn't make economic sense for the most part. But um, we're doing a solar test um, in another country starting in two weeks time. And uh, we're excited about that because uh, while we don't think solar is is very good for most mining, there are some cases where it is. Um, and the reason why solar is so interesting is solar is actually the most uh, prolific mini grid type. And so if you really want to be able to get to all those mini grids, you need to come up with a model that does work for solar. Um, we think it works in two ways. Um, one is if you have really old miners that you're just kind of putting out to pasture and trying to sweat those assets until, until they die, right? Because then it's okay if they only work eight or nine hours a day. They've already paid for themselves in some other, some other operation. Um, and, the, and then the other one is if you do have enough capital that you want to put in the battery backup, the ROI will be three times as long as if you did hydro or uh, geothermal or something like that. But it's uh, it's still it is viable. How much does the economics of Bitcoin in general 
influence the the model for you guys? I mean, what what sort of breadth of Bitcoin realities can can you guys accommodate? Um, we don't really think about the price that much. Um, we run all our models off of of um, kind of current day pricing, so we never look ahead to what it could be. Um, mm -hmm. The thing that that does affect us the most is this crazy difficulty adjustment that's been happening recently. Like it's it's way beyond what we were expecting, and so you know it just reduces the uh, the awards, and uh, of course that affects us. Yeah, I mean, so this is I, I think that you are not alone in in being surprised by this. You know, what is your sense of where that's coming from? Is it, you know, I mean, we're, we're not talking very much about, uh, you know, mining coming on in the Middle East is something that I've seen a number of people point to. But, you know, you guys obviously must think about that now that you've seen, you've seen it in practice. You know, does that does it does it create sort of, you know, risk for you guys? Yeah, I mean, I, we, we'd be. We'd be crazy to say that it doesn't provide some risk. Um, do I think it provides enough risk not to do it? Not at all. Uh, we start, you know, and we have a pretty good model, and then that we can we can tweak to to kind of current reality and maybe future, you know, really negative reality as well. And we think it still works. We have to pay attention to pricing a little closer then uh, to make sure that it works for our partners as well. Uh, most places we go in, we do a, a revenue sharing partnership with them. So they they make a percentage of the Bitcoin and we make the the other percentage. And so that works as long as they know that there's a there's a certain amount of value they can get for that Bitcoin if they want to spot sell it or or hold it. Um, in our world, it makes sense because even even as those risks increase, it makes sense because we do have some of the best economics in the world. Uh, because of the way this revenue share split works and because of the the grid not being very well developed means that we there's not a lot of places that that energy producer can sell either. So that gives us a really good position to go in and, and strike really good deals where, you know, like you go into some countries and you can get it down to, you know, two or f three cents. Uh, in Africa, whereas you can't, you can't find it under four cents in other places in North America or Europe. Is there, so as you guys have dug into this, you know, let's say that all these pilots go uh, exactly to plan, or at least, you know, well enough that there's lots of excitement for expansion. What do you anticipate being the main bottlenecks to expansion? Is it, you know, funding for the, the mini grids themselves to get up and running? Is it, you know, what, what are the biggest hurdles for, for kind of, you know, expanding, expanding gridless's footprint? Nathaniel laughing because you always steal my thunder with your answer, which is like, <laughs> yeah, it's the, the first one, right? The, the, the power being uh, finance itself. There's a there's a huge need for more financing of energy. We're thinking about even putting together our, our our own vehicle for that because we think that if we backstop it with the anchor tenancy of our own Bitcoin mining, we could we could very quickly um, find some independent power producers who are willing to to go and build that, um, and then get that return on investment instead of in 25 years and in, in seven or eight years, and so. Uh, you know, there's no reason that nobody else is doing this except that they don't maybe have the same lens into into Bitcoin mining as as we do, and um, and they're just used to an older way of doing the the financing. Yeah, it's super interesting. I mean, I'm sure that you've thought about this, but you know, Bitcoiners themselves provide a kind of interesting path for that to the extent that you guys do create its own vehicle because you have a lot of folks who are both um, you know, market motivated and smart market actors, but who are also invested in the sort of broader project and, you know, if it's sort of the choice between uh, you know, thing thing A that has immediate return but not a lot of alignment for them or thing B that has return, but also a lot of alignment for them. You're going to find a lot of Bitcoiners in that, you know, point B. So you know, to the extent that you create a vehicle that has uh, the opportunity for Bitcoiners to get involved, I bet there'd be a lot of interest. Yeah, it could be. I, but it's also just energy, guys. I think there's going to be energy yeah. people. I think there's two parties that are interested. It's Bitcoiners and it's energy people. And they're they're very aligned. Um, you know, I, I wasn't at this event in Texas. There was an energy um conference around Bitcoin in Texas a couple of last month and my, but my business partner was, and you know, there's just so, I think there's a lot of shared um, mental space 
between um, people who are involved in Bitcoin mining and uh, people involved in energy. Um, and I think that will only continue. And it's just opening up this this new frontier in Africa uh, where you can you can actually do some amazing things. There's a, just this massive gap of opportunity. I mean, oftentimes people talk about, you know, there's, you know, something about like two thirds of the population uh, who are not electric, you know, not connected to electricity in the world are in Africa. That's true. OK, um, that's not a that is a problem. But then that problem becomes an opportunity. Right. Where else can you go in the world and find that much energy that needs to be built? You know, because these people who are starting off using, you know, one kilowatt every other day are going to grow to being users of 10 kilowatts every other day. And then they're going to be using 100 kilowatts every every week, just like we do in the U.S. Right. There's going to be this snowballing effect. There's never a, there's never a need for less of the thing that becomes more efficient. Right. That's the Javon's paradox thing. Right. Which is like. You make something better, it doesn't, people don't use it less, they use it more. And so, you know, energy is that. And as we beca- as we make it more available uh, in Africa, uh, it's number one, good for humanity. It's what makes people's lives better. It's the single most important thing you can do to make somebody's life better. Um, but it also becomes a great economic uh, boon to those who invested in early. I love what you guys are building. I, I was super excited to see you working on this. Uh, I think you can probably tell. But, you know, obviously for for folks who are kind of seeing or upstream of the benefit of this in terms of having access to uh, to, to, to better energy or in terms of the these uh, these producers themselves having access to a more sustainable business model, obviously that's sort of the main payoff, right, is, is this thing solving uh, solving a key problem. But I'm interested in your take on sort of what the state of the Bitcoin discussion is as well, in the sense that, you know, you were just mentioning you've got a rev share arrangement and obviously these folks can keep the Bitcoin or they can uh, convert it. You know, are you seeing people, whether it's your kind of production partners or, you know, just sort of more broadly excited about Bitcoin? Is it a rising conversation? You know, uh, I'm just interested, I guess, in the larger dynamics of Bitcoin, you know, in and around the places that you're working. It's it's really it's fun. And I'll tell you why it's fun. It's because we're doing education the whole time. We start off and nobody knows what it is and or they've heard about it, but they don't really understand it. They don't know why it would help in their business. After half an hour, they they start understanding it and they're still asking us for, well, what's the minimum you can pay me in to, to put your data center in? And then us saying, no, listen, you're not selling this power to anybody. There's something interesting here that we can do together as a partnership. And then they finally buy in, and and then they, then they're on the journey like any other buddy, anybody else who started going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, which is now they're interested in this thing, and they're starting to earn it, and they're saying, okay, what is Bitcoin, and um, and trying to understand what how money this type of money differentiates from the other type of money, and um, so you, it, great conversations are had, and we have, um, you know, kind of we're working with the power partner. But then we have this kind of anchor into that whole community for other conversations to be had. And then they start thinking, like in Malawi, immediately start thinking, well, could Bitcoin be used by the villagers to pay for the energy to us instead of the kwacha? And, you know, conversations start happening, you know, around that. Anyway, it's, it becomes interesting and fun. Yes, everybody is now thinking about the price a little bit and whether or not the value um, will increase or not. I think that's a little bit human nature. Um, how we all fixate a little bit too much on what the what the the big numbers could be in the future. What does the next six months look like for you guys? What are the what are the biggest challenges that you see, and sort of you know what what are you excited about? So yeah, the next six months is building out um, probably about four new sites in that time, uh, maybe five. In uh, we'll we'll be active in three geographies for sure, maybe a fourth. And, um, and really my whole, my whole push, um, my zero to one for the company is getting to 10 Bitcoin a month. So, um, that's our goal. And I think we can, we can hit that in that time. Um, you know, with the difficulty adjustment going up, it's making my life harder, but, you know, I think we can still get there. Um, you know, the challenges we face, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's things as simple as, you know, the, Customs duty on imports changing in the country, and we have to we have to figure out ways around that or how to work within the system. Um, logistics and transportation have been fairly fairly good to us so far, um, and we're we're not overly worried about that. 
you know, it's, I talked, I'm, I'm talking to power people all the time, to energy producers all the time. And um, it's lining them up. The challenge for us is making sure we line up all the power that's out there and we're able to execute on it in good time. Well, I'm super excited for, for you guys to be on this journey. Uh, I want to check in in a few months and see how things are going. Uh, but for now, Eric, always great to talk to you and, uh, and excited to see what you build. Hey, thanks, Nathaniel. Always good to talk to you. Good to see you after so many years. Yeah, cheers. Cheers.